screen. Right now we are recording, so I'd like to welcome Asifa. Yes, that's me. How are you doing, Lubna? I am good. Would you like to introduce yourself for the viewers, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Asifa Lahore. I am a British Pakistani transgender woman living in London. Uh, I also perform as Britain's first out Muslim drag queen, which I've been doing for the last 14 years. And can, may I ask, were you born in the UK? I was. I was born in the UK. Um, I'm 41 years old, believe it or not. I know I look like ridiculously younger, I've been told all the time. But no, I was born in uh, in the early 80s in, in London. I see. And then um, can you explain kind of about, about yourself in terms of your journey and what you would like to speak about today? Sure. So... Um, Obviously, like I was born to Pakistani parents and uh, both my um, parents uh, are Pakistani. Uh, my dad's side of the family is from northern India, from Uttar Pradesh. Um, his family actually moved to Pakistan after partition, like in, in the 1950s. Uh, whilst my mom's family actually moved uh, in 1947. So I'm kind of a descendant of what is known in Pakistan as the Mahajir community, which is essentially the um, the Indian Muslims, the Urdu speakers that moved to Pakistan uh, at the time of partition. So um, I was born in the UK to my parents and um, I am very much a child of the 90s, a millennial, and I, um, from... Oops. That was right. bound to happen, wasn't it? That's all right. The bound camera's to happen. <laughs> That's all right. Is it okay now? Is it still? Yeah, uh, I can right see you. Up? Yes. Yeah, it's okay, fine. brilliant. So um for the longest time, I always remember that I was so different from everyone growing up, my cousins, my brother and sister, because I felt differently to everyone. Um, and it's only like when I sort of entered like late primary school that I realized that. Um, at the time, I was um, a guy who was attracted to other guys. Whilst everyone in my class, while all the boys in my class would be talking about other girls or, um, you know, starting to have crushes on other girls, me, I would actually start having crushes on the other boys. Um, and there was also a period in my life where I actually lived in Pakistan from the ages of 11 to 14. I was in Pakistan. Uh, I think my mom and dad had this dream of moving back to Pakistan. And then they moved back and realized, actually, no, <laughs> we're, we're better in the, in the UK. So we came back to the UK. Um, but, um, you know, to cut a long story short, I am part of the LGBTQ community. Um, I, I live my life as a gay man for many, many years. Um, and it's only sort of like in my early 30s, I actually realized that no I I am transgender I'm transgender female um, and I um, began transitioning in my early 30s um, and I've been living my life as a transgender woman um, for you know a good part of 10 years now. Right I do have lots of questions for you because um, I think that it would be interesting to understand so when you were still and I, I get I'm very cautious of what I say because I'm quite candid and I appreciate this is kind of oh. sensitive topic so if I hesitate it's because I'm trying not to say the wrong thing <laughs> you know so of if course. you could explain your journey so when you had not transitioned and you were a homosexual basically because you were still um a male like what was that journey like when did you understand okay this is how you are I know you said it started started at primary school but like when did you accept yourself officially as, okay, I'm actually homosexual, and then you started having relationships? What was that phase like? Were your family aware? How did that go? And then when you decided to transition, how was that journey for you? And um, if you could explain the support that you've had from your family as well. Sure. So for the longest time, I just kept it to myself because I think the moment I realised who I was, also being a Pakistani, 
um, and obviously of Muslim faith, the moment you realize that you're queer, the same with that same sort of thought comes the thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this because it's against my culture, it's against my religion. Um, and so I just kept it to myself for many, many, many years. And I kind of, I think a lot of British Pakistanis can relate to this in the sense that um, I lived a compartmentalized life where in the house I was this, you know, great Pakistani boy, you know, the apple of my mom and dad's eye, you know, um, all the aunties would love me kind of thing. Um, but outside, outside of the house, I was like um, totally different. Like um, whenever I'd go college or university, I would be out there sort of living my life and uh, kind of kept these two parts of my life really compartmentalized. Um, I came out in my early 20s to my mom and dad because I was getting a lot of pressure to marry at that point, uh, like, you know, most Pakistani people do. Um, and at the same time, I had met someone um, at university who was also, um, you know, a gay Pakistani man as well. Um, and I decided to kind of take the plunge and tell my mom and dad, look, I, I'm not going to get married because this is the reason. And kind of like all hell broke loose. Like, first of all, it was like, okay, let's try and contain this. Let's try and keep this within the immediate family and not tell the entire community or try and, you know, um, not publicize it because, you know, not promote it in a sense. So, God, I was taken to like the GP because my mom and dad thought, you know, uh, I remember my dad think, saying to me, Yeah, to my machinery, they come, career. Um and um and I you know I was so like, to translate that like for, that. So to translate that for the English audience, is your private partner working? <laughs> exactly. So is your machinery not working? Um and I said it's nothing to do with that. And when you do go to the doctor, um you'll understand. And I think for my mum and dad, so our family doctor, again, was a Desi doctor. Like, I think, uh, you know, I think British Pakistanis, South Asian communities in, in the UK kind of gravitate, especially of my millennial generation and my mum and dad's generation gravitated towards having a Desi GP, um, you know, a South Asian GP. So my GP was um, Hindu Indian. Uh, there was also doc there was Dr. Patel and Dr. Singh and they sort of sat my mom and dad down and said look there's nothing medically wrong here there's nothing we can do to um, uh, to change um, your son it's very much like um, he has this feelings we understand that you know religiously culturally it might be challenging but there's nothing sort of wrong here and that kind of gave me a bit of strength because Dr. Patel and Dr. Singh were like they were like, um, you know, Indian men in their 60s at the time that kind of stuck up for me. And I was kind of like, wow, OK, this is cool. But, you know, mum and dad were like, oh, what do they know? They're Indian. You know, if they were Pakistani, it'd be a whole different kettle of fish. So I was then taken to like the imam at my local um, mosque. Um, and the, the imam kind of like said all sorts of things like um, a lot of it was about like therapy through Islam and I say that in inverted commas and I, I'm speaking very candidly here it was very much like two or three options number one was devote yourself to Islam become like this pious person that just kind of prays five times a day devotes their time to the to the um to the mosque um someone who fasts all the time and you know if you fast and dedicate your life to to Islam then those feelings will kind of like be diminished kind of like um you know by fasting like your your hormones will be suppressed if you like and you won't be thinking like this all the time so there was that option um and at the time i mean this was the mid noughties and my mom and dad were a little bit hesitant because it was kind of like we don't want him and at the time those were my pronouns getting involved so intensely in the mosque because you know, there was a lot of recruitment going on at the time. It was post 9-11. There was a lot of recruitment going on in, in, in local mosques. Um, a lot of like Islamic As an propaganda. extremist recruitment? Extremist recruitment. Yeah, extremist recruitment. A lot of like, you know, propaganda. I mean, I would hear stuff about, 
you know, oh, the the Americans blew up their own twin towers, and you know, this is why we must all stick together as a community. And my, I didn't want to get involved in that, and neither did my mum and dad. And and because I was studying, um, you know, at university at the time, my mum and dad, you know, very cleverly were like, we don't want him getting involved in in stuff like that because it's just going to ruin his life and ruin his 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 education. Um, the second option, which was my mum and dad's preferred option too, was get married, get married to someone back home who won't know. Um, and again, I've always been a very candid person, a very honest and um, authentic person. And, you know, if we take Islam for its authenticity, it's about honesty, it's about truth. I said to the Imam Saab, I said, look, what woman in their right mind would marry me? Here I am, an early 20-something, very effeminate, pretty boy. Um, and you can go and look on Insta um, Instagram and uh, YouTube for, you know, all my early interviews. I was a very, very pretty, handsome boy. But at the same time, it was very obvious that I was gay. And uh, I said, I said to the imam, I said, you know, would you give your daughter to uh, uh, as a uh, hand in marriage to me? Uh, and he said, no. And I said, why? And he said, because you're gay. And I was like, duh, exactly. Duh. What, you know, even if somebody in Pakistan, a woman, um, you know, my mom and dad were like, oh, why don't you marry someone who's, you know, I don't know, um, a widow who's got two or three kids who who you could benefit. And I was like, realistically, no one, once they know, it's either going to be, it's either going to be a woman or a girl who wants an easy ride to the UK in terms of passport, or, um, you know, no one's no one realistically is going to marry me. Um, and then once and my mom and dad could see that the reality of it all, um, and I'm not going to talk about the years of depression that I had and anxiety I had around it because never did my mom and dad once me to leave my house or they wanted to kick me out which is you know the experience of a lot of British Pakistanis that are queer they had that experience I didn't have that experience my mom and dad very much were like I think you know I come from a very unique British Pakistani family my older brother is severely um, autistic uh, and my younger I'm the middle child and then you have my younger sister uh, my younger sister is married, uh, lives in France, in Paris, um, has married uh, a white French guy. And she says because of my experiences, she's she's very much um, fight. She's had to fight for her life and she's really happy. And my mom and dad are very happy as well because of that. So I come from quite a traditional and conservative British Pakistani family, but also one that is very authentic and has had to deal with you know, uh, depression, um, autism, interracial love, homosexuality, transgenderism. So we de we've dealt with it as, as a family. But at that time, it was very much like, okay, it, we, uh, with the imam, it was very much like, okay, he wants to marry his boyfriend of the time. Uh, what does Islam say about that? And at the time, you know, civil partnerships were just coming gay marriage same-sex marriage was very much in its infancy in the UK um, but the Imam Saab said that look as long as I think the Imam Saab was very much like I'd rather he was married and in a monogamous relationship rather than what he described as paedophilia or promiscuousness that can happen in the queer community and I said well promiscuity can happen in the straight community as well it's not just a queer thing you know promiscuity happens in in Pakistan in the UK to British Pakistani communities as well um, but I I'm very much you know I, I choose to live my life uh, monogamously because uh, that works for me um, so he was very much like as long as you don't promote it out there in the open go and have your same-sex marriage um, and so I did that for a number of years. As in, did you get married? Uh, or so are you married? Are you married now? And did you get married <clears throat> before you transitioned? No, so I got married before I transitioned. It was to another uh, Pakistani man. 
um, who uh, identified as bisexual. Um, somebody I met in, in university. Um, and I was in a civil partnership with him for many, many years. Um, for a good part of, I'd say, six, seven years. And that was before I transitioned. I think once I made that decision to transition um, and live my life as female, um, that that union came to an end. So uh, your partner wasn't supportive of you transitioning? I think my partner was um, supportive of me transitioning. However, he identified, um, you know, as a bisexual man, and I think he particularly wanted to be with a guy. Now, during that union, there were, you know, I, that's when I started my drag career. I began performing. I always wanted to be a performer. Um, and when I entered that period in my life where I'd come out to my family, I was very happy. And um, I I went back to sort of performing because as a teenager, I didn't pursue a career in performing because I was always scared that my parents would find out about my who I really was. And even though I went to the Brit school and I was offered a, um, a place at RADA, I turned it down and, and went to university instead. Um, I think, you know, when I was in a period in my life where I was happy, I, I then decided to pursue um, performing and I did it via cabaret and drag. Um, and my partner was supportive of that, but I think once I realized when via drag, once I realized that I actually, this is more than performing for me, it's actually, I am female, I want to, you know, transition and, and be and be female. That's when, you know, those conversations with my partner of the time happened. And I knew that God, if I had to come out all over again, this time it would be publicly because by that point I... I was doing like um, you know national documentaries and and my social media presence was was quite um, uh, high profile. So I, um, I I had to think about it. I had to really think about do I want you know the first time around was so traumatic. Do I want to now come over come out all over again but be at you know do it publicly this time and um, but I'm glad I did. I mean I've always been about living one's true life, living authentically to all identities. And I couldn't lie to myself or to other people. So, yeah, so it's interesting. I, it's interesting to hear. So when you um, started performing as a drug, that's when you realised actually this is who you are. Can you explain, and, and the time goes by really quickly here. I know 40, it sounds like 40 minutes, but it goes by very yeah, quickly. I so, know. Um, is it possible if you could please explain what has your transition process been like how far have you transitioned have you transitioned completely if you could share a bit about that and then i've got some loads of more questions because i think you wanted to talk about the pakistani community and and how and yes. even pakistan and things like that so i want to get on to yes. that before the fall ends sure sure yeah. so um basically i realized i realized very early on that i i was trans female and i wanted to transition fully from male to female um, but um it was only when i'm when i went to south africa and this was in my early 30s i went for a conference in south africa for lgbt muslim queer activists uh, from around the world and i literally met um Pakistani trans women and men who were at the conference. Um, and when I met them, I had flashbacks to when I was living in Karachi between the ages of 11 and 14, where I would see trans men and women begging on the streets or performing at weddings or, you know, working in employment in, in top jobs. Um, and I realized, God, like in the UK, there's such an invisibility around being trans, but in Pakistan, it's always been there. And I just assumed that when when I came back to the UK and that in the UK, it was just called, you know, lesbian, gay and bisexual. So it's only when I had this light bulb moment in my early 30s that I was like, no, this, this is who I really am. I'm actually transgender. And I want to, here I am, a privileged, um, you know, British Pakistani. I've got access to healthcare. 
Um, and and here are these, you know, Pakistani men and women that are transgender that are doing it all by themselves and self-medicating and, you know, getting, you know, funding it themselves. Why am I just wasting my life? So I went to my GP. I told them about who I really was and I had this whole, you know, year of counselling through the NHS, through the gender clinics. Um, and I know there's a separate argument in the UK about how easy it is to transition, but actually it isn't. You've got to go through kind of like two years of, of um, hormone therapy, of of uh, counselling, of deciding, you know, whether you want to kind of like... Uh, me personally, I've had the whole um, um, hormone therapy. Um, I've gone through uh, surgery to have a vaginal plasty. And I'm I'm super super happy. Um, this may sound really dumb question, and I don't mean because mm. I don't know much about this area. And if I yeah. ask the question and you're not comfortable answering, obviously you, yeah. there's no obligation to answer anything. So so you've had a male private part, and then you've got that removed. Was when you had the surgery, how did you feel? Like did you feel different? Like you know, because you've always had something there. And then all of yeah. a sudden you don't like, how old was that? So when I began living as female, um, and this was long before, like, um, I've always been a very, very pretty boy. So even um, people would just assume, like, when they, they would meet me, my voice, my 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 natural bone structure, my hair and everything, people would just assume that I would, would be female. And it's only when... Um, you know, that um, I would point out that actually I was male because I've also been super, super slim, um, that they would realise that actually, oh, I was, you know, a very effeminate male person. Um, but uh, when I, you know, went for those therapies, those counselling sessions and began taking hormones, I became even more and more, like appearance-wise, even more feminine. So for me, I was always indifferent to my genitalia and I want to be totally upfront and candid with you um even in my male relationships that I would have previously I would always be treated as the woman um, in 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 gay culture there's the bottom and the top and and versatile people as well I was always the bottom I was always treated as the woman in my relationships um so for me I was very indifferent to my genitalia so for me, it was a natural sort of instinct that, yes, I want to, you know, have a vagina. And so when it came to that part of my transition, it was um, both the the psychologists, both the surgeons, you kind of have to jump through these hoops and, and be assessed. And I was very much like given the all clear. And yeah, I had my surgery two years ago. Can I ask, and again, I'm because uh, I'm very, very intrigued. I'm very curious. Again, I feel like I know it's full candid with Livna, but I also mm. don't want to ask inappropriate questions. But I'm I'm curious, and there may be other people curious. So when you were the essential, essentially, you said the female in the role when you were as a homosexual, how you still relieved yourself in the male way, right? Because with your with your private parts. <laughs> no god wow what a question sorry i'm just um, no no it's because fine it's, because it's fine i'm i like to be an open book i um how can i say i so i would i would i in my relationships i would essentially play the part of a woman and when it came to relieving myself very rarely I would I very rarely would I be relieved with my partner I'd, I'd just do that by myself okay I see interesting and then can I ask the um the transition that you've had so you have a fully like like a, a woman's partner like a vagina and do you uh, uh, feel yes. anything from it like is it fully functioning like you can you can have an orga or orgasm as well Yes, so I have a fully functioning vagina. I can have orgasms. I can um, use it, as it were. Um, wow. So yes. Oh, so interesting. I I've never obviously because I'd love to ask these questions, but I've never had the guts to. Neither have I found someone who'd be willing to answer. That's very interesting. 
Um, and then, um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I really, really appreciate it because I know it takes a lot of courage to share your story. I think you wanted to also talk about Pakistan and um, what happens over there. So would you like to speak yeah. about that stuff? Yeah. Sure. So I come and go to Pakistan all the time. I, I like I said, I've I've got family uh, in Pakistan, but also I come and go for work. So I shoot a lot of my uh, music videos in Pakistan, and um, there is a massive like queer community in Pakistan. Uh, the transgender community, um, or the hijra community as they're known, are very much visible out there. They're the most visible out there, and they have been for centuries and millennia even before colonialism, even before, you know, the creation of Pakistan, they've been there. And um, while I was living there, I obviously knew of them, but it's only like when I reconnected and, and went back to Pakistan as a, as a trans woman that I really made friends. And, you know, I, I'm in touch with, for example, Pakistan's first um, transgender female model, Garmi Chaudhary. I personally know Dr. Sarah Gill, who's like the first transgender doctor for the community. Um, we have newsreaders, actresses, all sorts of things in Pakistan um, uh, in terms of transgenderism. Um, and in law, so um, I, I'm, I've always been dual national um, and I've had my British documents converted over to female. I'm now in the process of actually getting my um, documents converted over in Pakistan, my dual nationality. And this is probably going to blow your mind a little bit. I'm going to be very honest and candid. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to the Pakistani High Commission in London um, and they told me the process. And they also told me to send them an email regarding it so they can get it officialized from from Pakistan as well. So I received an email um, from them a week or so ago, maybe a little bit more earlier, where they said, I've got to go to Pakistan to be examined, um, to see if I am fully female, um, and then my documents can be converted over. Um, now, I will either have a choice. I can either have a Pakistani nationality as transgender or as female. And that's very interesting because not all Pakistani transgender people and women can have that choice. I'm getting that choice because of my British privilege. Um, and I understand that. Um, so, yeah, um, I do have links with the with uh, um, Pakistan as well in that respect. I see. And I, I'm going to be honest, when, since a child, when I've gone to Pakistan, like I think you touched on this in the in before, in the UK I never saw any transgender people. I thought this was just something. As a child, I just thought this is something that you I saw in Pakistan and India because I watched Bollywood movies and I would see that in the movies as well. So I thought as a child this was just some something you find in Pakistan and India, and um, so it's really strange that word transgender. I didn't even clock, I would say until recently, maybe the five, the last five years, I think it's now becoming a bit more, um, there's more education about it. There's more uh, information about it and more knowledge. You know, people are speaking up and all that kind of stuff. But I would say, do you think the UK has been behind then and the Western countries have been behind in transgender identity in comparison to places like India, Pakistan? Because over there, it was very, you know, it's it's obvious, but over here, it's been behind the doors kind of thing. I felt like it's behind. Most definitely, most definitely behind. I mean, if we look, you know, centuries and millennia ago, um, most parts of the world, so South Asia, East Asia, um, parts of Africa, um, the indig indigenous people uh, in Australia and um, America, you know, you have two spirited communities, you have transgender communities, um, you have... In parts of Africa, you have tribes that, you know, are polygamous, for example, um, uh, and identify very differently in terms of gender. Um, when I think of South Asia, for example, the Mughals, for example, pre-colonialism, um, pre um, transgender people were part of the arts community. They were involved in the Mughal courts. Um, uh, uh, if we look at the Islamic revolution, 
um, I mean, transgender people actually guarded the the parlors of Prophet Muhammad's wives. They uh, guarded um, his grave, for example. They were allowed to. They they're known as muhannas, uh, very much in Arabic um, culture and history. So we have always been here, but in the West. You know, uh, it's interesting. Colonialism, the British, for example, went in most parts of the world and decriminalized homosexuality and much of the Commonwealth uh, and South Asia included. The laws that are in place at the moment are all British penal codes that are still being used. Um, but now, many years later, you know, in the UK in, in the late 60s, it was decriminalized here and uh, many laws for for LGBT communities have taken place in the UK when they have decided, when the British have decided, and that's cool. But now that they're coming to terms with the LGB, they're still struggling with the T. Whereas in other parts of the world, especially in the East, the T has always been there and people have got the T. Um, and it's got to the point now in Pakistan, you can have equal rights, you can have employment, you can... I'm not saying things are rosy there. No, they're not at all. But... Th th People understand what it is to be a hijra. They understand what it is to be transgender. Um, I have, this is me opening up and we've got eight minutes left, so I don't want to delve into. Um, this for me is a little bit of a difficult topic, the transgender one. And um, so this for me will be probably not like closure speaking to you, but maybe a bit like closure. When I've gone to Pakistan as a child, I only saw tra transgender people in Pakistan. And for me, obviously as a child, you know, like the clapping and all that kind of stuff, I wasn't used mm. to that. And mm. if I'm being honest, and I, and I, I'm, I'm, the, because it's a sensitive topic, I'm, very, I'm trying to be very careful what I say. Mm. I, I would say I probably got childhood trauma in relation to um, my experiences in Pakistan. As a child, because mm. obviously over here there weren't any transgenders. When I went over there, in a child's mind, so if you imagine I'm a nine-year-old and I'm seeing transgender, and I couldn't figure out are these are they men? Are they women? Are they men pretending to be women? Like you know, as a child, and uh, the the stories as a lot of people would come up with about transgenders is what scared me. Like they would mm. say, oh, you know, the the hijri, they get children in the middle of the night and they convert them and they chop the private parts off and they convert them into hijri and stuff like that. Those kind of stories mm, as a mm, child would scare the shit out mm. because A, I had never saw this kind of stuff in the UK. And mm. then I would say in, in Pakistan, generally they're quite direct and they're too open and maybe they're not careful about what they're talking about in front of children. I would say generally sometimes, depending on the type of family and relatives you have. Mm. And uh, so I used to be quite scared of transgender people when I used to go to Pakistan as a child mm. and um mm. and and the some of the relatives who used to laugh at the fear i would have and they would push me in the transgender you know so i i i had a, a bit of child i would say childhood trauma oh. in relation oh. to it and i feel scared talking about it because in mm. case someone brands me as transphobic if i'm being mm. honest you know mm. so i feel like um so i do have that Part of me I'm not going to lie the, the child in me that is scared is still there I'm not saying of you but yeah. generally you know just that feeling yeah, of yeah, the yeah. clapping and stuff yeah so um and I think when transgender started becoming more visible in UK this is the first time I realized actually a bit there is more to transgender it's not just a Pakistani India like there mm. is it's just over for some reason in the west it wasn't visible and I think that what I've had to do is re-educate myself about it like transgenders and what the situation is and I think that's why I'm very much intrigued by you as well because there may be other people in my situation who are too scared to say anything as well because yeah. if you're branded transphobic or you're branded something else I would say there's definitely a lack of education and I would say it's very interesting what you mentioned about Prophet Muhammad and because I don't hear any of that kind of stuff about I've never heard anyone talk about transgenders and Islam <laughs> well, there I, you I, was go. Under the I mean that's what the clerics want you the clerics want you not to know this kind of stuff you know it's all there but they'll never they'll never talk about this they'll never talk about you know slavery slavery being okay in islam for example um yeah. when it shouldn't be i personally 
So, but, um, so, so what's your thought about Islam and transgender and the general image of transgender people you think in that people have? What has your experience been? Are, are you well treated by most people or is there any like discrimination you faced in any way? I mean, yes, of course, discrimination is there all the time. And, you know, the, for example, like, you know, I totally respect your experience as a child. And I don't think that makes voicing that and talking about that trauma doesn't make you transphobic. I think that's a, that's um, especially, um, you know, uh, those experiences that you had, they're based especially on rumors, gossip and um, miseducation. It goes back to the whole idea of, you know, queer people being pedophiles and, um, you know, uh, uh, oversexed people or you know and, and when that filters in from uh, from a young age at a child you can only grow up thinking that and it's only when you meet people um and you know right now there's a lot of people a lot of transgender people in Pakistan very much trying to um, uh you know make sure that that stereotype isn't perpetuated um but going back to your um, question about transgenderism in Islam, like historically, it's there. It's 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 there in the scriptures. It's there in the hadiths, um, and um, you know you can look up the the dancing boys of Medina and the hadiths there, and how the Prophet would say, you know, leave them alone. They are they are who they are, kind of thing. And as long as they're not causing trouble or being vulgar, then then let them be, as it were. Um, I think when it comes to Islam, it's it's mostly about modesty and and politeness and and um, I think me personally, look, I, I come and go. I, I class myself as a Muslim, and just like most British Muslims, well, just like most Muslims worldwide, I'm a hypocrite. I pick and choose bits and pieces that suit me, um, and um, and that's okay. I've come to accept that, you know, and. Um, many people have always told me, many Muslims actually have always told me, leave Islam, leave Islam, this isn't right in Islam. And I'm like, well, you've got Pakistan, an Islamic country based on Islam, constitution based on Islam, accepting it. You know, you've got fatwas in Pakistan. There's a 2016 fatwa in Pakistan that says that transgender people can marry, you know, but... If a, it's all down to appearance, it's all down to the gender. So if a if a transgender person appears more feminine and identifies more as female, then they can marry a male and vice versa, for example, if both, both parties are willing. Um, so, you know, when it does come to transgenderism, especially in Pakistan, I think it's mixed in very much with the Desi culture, with South Asian culture more than say Arab culture because Arab yeah. culture tends to be a bit more conservative a bit more orthodox I'd say mm. um, and racism and, and slavery comes into play there if you like but you only need to do your research you only actually need to look at what's been said actually what's been said and written rather yeah. than what is interpreted by the clerical right. I think the interpretation is I would say that's the reason I haven't completely, and I said this before, so the call's going to drop off in literally 30 seconds because this is like an automatic timer. So but this is where I say I'm not an ex-Muslim, I'm not a Muslim because I'm still researching, you know, mm. um, because I'm still practicing Islam, but because I have doubts, I can't completely put my hand on my heart and say, I, I believe everything is right. But sorry, this call's going to drop off. I'd love, love to have you again. So much, thank you so much for being so candid. Because I know you. it's quite tricky talking about personal things, but I really, really appreciate this. And hopefully the viewers would love this as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.